Hello everyone and welcome back to our presentation on the great video game crash of 1983 and what caused it. Uh, so we've already talked about in the previous video how the video game industry managed to take off like a lightning bolt early on uh, because of sales of things like Pong and then the Atari 2600. Atari was making bank. By 1982 we mentioned that Atari was making over a billion dollars in sales just on the console hardware, not even counting games. And that by 1983, if you add together every single video game company in the United States, all added together, they were making less than $100 million, which seems like a lot of money, but down from well over a billion just on hardware is astonishing. And so where last video left off was questioning what in the world happened. We've never seen this kind of thing happen before. No mass communication or mass media platform has ever crashed like this. So there are three things we can look at. The first one is going to start off talking about computers. One of the things that caused the great video game crash of 1983 is that it happened to correspond exactly with the moment in the United States that personal computers got really cheap. You could go down to the Radio Shack for a couple hundred bucks to a thousand dollars and get yourself a computer. Uh, sometimes it would be more than that if you got a really good model. Now when we think about the computers of the early 1980s, if we were to think about the computing revolution, we would think about them in terms mostly of the Apple II, the computer on the left here. But the Apple II had been around up to this point, and it's not really the reason we had this massive explosion of people buying personal computers. It was actually this computer on the right here. It was the Commodore PET, the PET. And the reason why the Commodore PET became the, the sort of forgotten hero of the early PC uh, era is because it was really cheap. Not cheap in its construction. It was pretty well put together, but it was a lot cheaper to go to the store and buy a Commodore PET than it was to go buy an Apple II. It came with the monitor built in, it had a built-in cassette tape for data cassettes, which if you didn't know data cassettes existed, go look those up, they are wild. Uh, and it wasn't the most user-friendly thing in the world, but it would certainly work and work for way less money than an Apple. So all of that to say this, personal computers had gotten really, really cheap. And they could do a lot of different things. You could type out a Word document, you could store files and data, you could use a spreadsheet to calculate numbers and run statistics in a way that you had never been able to do on a computer before, and you could do it at home. And on top of all of that, on top of all of the other stuff it could do with Word documents and with spreadsheets, early computers like this uh, could play games. People started developing video games specifically to run on the personal computer. One of my favorites from back in the day is Oregon Trail. I don't know how many of you have uh, also have positive memories of this game, but I can distinctly remember being in elementary school uh, and being sort of herded into a computer lab once a week uh, to play Oregon Trail on some old Apple II computers. We would have little contests among our friends to see who could make it to Oregon first and who could manage to make it there without killing uh, as many people uh, as, uh, as we could. So it was this sort of contest. So games like Oregon Trail started popping up on these computers, among lots of other games. And so when these things started to pop up, these personal computers that could also play games, people started asking themselves, like, why would I go buy an Atari 2600, which is ostensibly just a computer. It's a bunch of circuit boards in a box together. Why would I go buy a computer that only plays video games? when I could go buy a Commodore PET or an Apple II, which can play video games and do a bunch of other stuff. You could also type out a, a, a Word document. You could save your taxes and tax information in a spreadsheet and have it crunch the numbers for you. It was multitasking. It was a, a device that could do a lot more than just games. And so that really hurt the sales of uh, Atari 2600s and other video game boxes because of the idea of, well, what need does it fulfill if the personal computer will do that and some more things? That actually connects really nicely to a theory we've already talked a lot about in this class, which is uses and gratifications theory. Remember, this theory states that people make active decisions 
in terms of the media they consume. And they do it because they know it fulfills some sort of internal need, some sort of thing and desire living in their head. And so if the desire was to uh, have some sort of interactive entertainment you could do at home, a personal computer could do that and then some more things, way more than a Atari 2600 could. But there was also a, a different, much more literal, much more surface level reason we can look at how personal computers impacted the sales of video games in the early 1980s. And it is that the games that were built for the computers were on floppy disks, and floppy disks were very easy to copy. All you had to do was take a disk that had, let's say, a copy of Oregon Trail on it, pop it into a disk drive like the one you're looking at there, you would load the files onto your personal computer, you would remove the disk with Oregon Trail and replace it with a blank disk in the drive, and then you could just dump all the game files back onto the blank disk. There was no protective software built in, there were no uh, locks and keys, it was all just open to be stolen uh, very, very, very easily. And so because games were being built knowing this, that they were going to be stolen pretty quickly, uh, it was sort of a, a wide open mentality. It was the thought that if you knew a friend that had lots of games for their computer, it was an incentive to buy a personal computer because you could just copy all of the games they had already and you would have this library of games that you didn't have to pay for. You, there was no real good way to steal Atari 2600 games. You couldn't offload them onto a computer and then reload them later. So it became not just cheaper to buy the computer, but it also became cheaper to copy the games yourself and essentially kind of steal them, uh, as we would talk about them later. All right, so that is one reason why uh, the personal computers were one reason why the video game crash of 1983 happened. All right, here is another one of the reasons why the great video game crash of 1983 occurred. And it is that the competition between the manufacturers of these consoles got really out of control. So we take for granted that uh, the competition is the way it is. Uh, first of all, I'm going to fix this because uh, PowerPoint does not seem to recognize the word y'all, and it really should. We're in Georgia. So uh, the... Competition got really uh, nuts. We are sort of used to a three-way competition in terms of video games nowadays, right? We are used to Microsoft manufacturing their Xbox. We're used to Sony manufacturing the PlayStation. Uh, this is the PS4 logo, but they have announced to the PS5 since then, which is a very uncreative name. And we're used to Nintendo, which currently manufactures the Switch. Uh, it's a three-way competition in modern times. But... In the five years between Atari 2600's launch and then the crash in 1983, there were 12 other video game consoles that launched. Uh, it was an absurd number, right? We take for granted that, that we only have to pick between three if we want to think about video game consoles now. Back then, you had to pick between 12. And I'm just going to run down the list really fast because I've got it in front of me. Uh, and it is uh, a really, really wonderful thing. So there, let's start with this one. This was the Bally Astrocade. Uh, one of the things that you should notice as we scroll through these is, that one, how much these things all kind of look similar to each other. They all have a slot for a cartridge. They all have uh, some buttons on the front for programming what you want to program. They all have attached controllers. And also I love, especially with the ones like the Bally Arcade uh, or the Bally Astrocade, uh, I really like that they have the wood paneling that the Atari 2600 also has. So uh, going down the list from there, you have the Magnavox Odyssey 2. Uh, you have the Mattel Intellivision. Uh, the wood paneling on that one is slightly darker. Uh, you have the Emerson Arcadia 2001. Uh, you have the ColecoVision, which is one of the better selling ones outside of the 2600. Uh, excuse me, the 2600. Uh, you have the RCA Studio 2. You have the Acetronic MPU 1000. You have the APF MP 1000, which is not a very easy to say name. You have the Intertron Electronic VC 4000. You have the Epic Cassette Vision, which billed itself as being better than the competition because it used cassette data 
uh, as opposed to cartridge data to run everything. You had the VTech Create a Vision, and then last but not least, you have the only one that is at all slightly different than the rest of them. You have the Vectrex. Uh, and the Vectrex came with a built-in vector monitor that you would plug in, uh, and the controller came straight out of the bottom, so you could plug it into the wall and then play it anywhere. These are super rare nowadays because the vector monitors break down on them a lot. I would love to find an old Vectrex somewhere and be able to buy it. So with this 12 different other video game systems uh, on top of the Atari, you can imagine that this caused some confusion, especially among parents who were thinking about buying a video game system for their kid. Like, imagine how many kids woke up on Christmas morning in the early 80s thinking that they were getting an Atari 2600. They had been begging their parents for an Atari 2600, only to find out that their well-meaning parents got them an Intertron Electrix VC4000. And if you're anything like me, with Christmas presents and stuff like that, you sort of feel guilty that you're getting anything, so you, you sort of put up a big show about how, like, oh, no, I really do like it. It is wonderful. I, I'll, I'm totally going to play the games on my Intertron Electrix VC4000. So at some point, kids just got fed up and quit asking for video game systems for Christmases and birthdays because they were getting systems they didn't actually want. Parents got fed up because they didn't understand the difference. They're just these weird electronic company names followed by numbers. How are they supposed to know which one is different from the other one? None of the games crossed over for these systems either. Neither did any of the controllers or even some of the plugs into the wall for power. So it was really confusing to have 12 different companies out there manufacturing a video game system. All right, so we've covered the first two reasons why. One is that personal computers got very cheap and could do a lot more than just play games. The other is that there was tons of competition out there, arguably too much competition. Uh, and then finally, number three, is that the games themselves uh, went super downhill. Uh, they were uh, increasingly not good, the games that were being produced for these systems, including the Atari 2600, which was still, even though there was all that competition, the best-selling box. Just as a side note here, uh, because Atari never protected their... Uh, system, which we'll talk about here in uh, a little bit, plus in video three about this story. Uh, the world opened up so that you could have companies that manufactured games for a game system that weren't a part of the game company itself. So it initially all starts because three program pre programmers who were making games uh, for Atari, they were tired of getting underpaid. They felt like uh, they were... Um, sort of being run into the ground. Uh, also at the time, Atari was very protective about the names of producers and programmers because they didn't want them to get poached by other companies, so they wouldn't let you put credits on a video game. And so these three programmers were tired of being underpaid, they were tired of not being able to put their names on their work, and they decided, hey, we don't actually need to work for Atari, we'll spin off, we'll make our own company that will make video games for Atari, but we will be unaffiliated with Atari, uh, and this is the first of the third-party video game companies. Uh, the very first third-party video game company, as in a company that makes video games for a system but does not work for the company that makes the system, uh, was Activision. Those three folks spun off, made their own company called Activision, uh, which is a company that is still around today. Now, the thing is, is that Activision, as a third-party company, made really good popular games. They poured a lot of their heart and soul into the production of their games. They tested them very well. They made sure they worked. They made sure they were fun. The issue is that a lot of other third-party companies didn't go to those lengths. They didn't bother to product test. They didn't bother with... Uh, quality assurance testing. They kind of just very quickly and very cheaply produced these very bad games and just pumped them out onto store shelves for people to buy. Uh, so Atari at some point just realized they had no control over what was being played on their own system because they never put any checks in place. They were largely the first ones to do this other than Fairchild. So what were they going to know about security for their system? Uh, and so increasingly people were buying these third-party games 
uh, and realizing once they got home and popped them into the Atari 2600 that, oh, these games are terrible. And even when they did, even when Atari did have control over it, increasingly because of demand, the games were getting worse and worse. Atari were giving their programmers less and less time to build the games, and so the actual end result were games that were uh, of increasingly poor quality. One of the most infamous of these is the port to Atari 2600 for Pac-Man. So on the left here is what Pac-Man would look like if you went to an arcade and you popped in a quarter and you decided to play a game of Pac-Man. It's bright and colorful. Uh, it's fast moving. It's got great sound if you've ever listened to a Pac-Man machine. Uh, it's a really wonderful experience to play an old school Pac-Man machine. And then on the right here is what it looked like if you bought the Atari 2600 Home Edition of Pac-Man. If you'll notice, instead of there being four ghosts, there's only one. Uh, Pac-Man is uh, all squat here. Uh, the dashes look different. The course itself is much smaller. Uh, also, I can't play this part for you, but it sounded terrible. It was just an awful thing. Uh, it was a real insult to the wonder that is Pac-Man. And you would imagine a lot of people bought this thinking, oh, dang, I'm going to get to play Pac-Man at home, only to realize, well, yeah, but you're going to play that Pac-Man at home. But Pac-Man's not the, the nail in the coffin. It's not the thing that actually did it. In 1982, uh, this is one year before the crash, if you'll remember, that we're talking about. Uh, in preparation for the launch of the movie E.T. the Extraterrestrial, uh, Steven Spielberg, if you'll remember uh, him from our conversation about the PG-13 rating when we were talking about movies, uh, him and Universal Studios commissioned Atari to make a movie based on, or make a game based on the movie. They wanted there to be a Atari 2600 game called E.T. on the shelves for people to buy when the movie was in theaters. Uh, and they wanted this for cross-promotional purposes because they thought it would help uh, send uh, more people to the theater. They thought it would help be good cross-promotion. Uh, and so they wanted this done. The only issue is that they came and asked Atari to do this about five weeks before the movie was meant to be in theaters, meaning that Atari had no time to turn anything around. And so they get this developer for them, uh, Howard Scott Warshaw. Remember him? He's from the first video. Uh, he uh, is the one who was unfortunately blamed for killing video games. He ended up being the lead producer and the lead developer on the E.T. game. They only gave him five weeks total to invent the game from scratch. They famously gave him no guidance on what the game should be. They gave him no guidance on what direction it should go in, how it should play, how it should look, how it should sound. They just said, hey, you have five weeks. Make us a video game that involves E.T. Uh, and it put him under a lot of pressure. Hey, here he is again. This is a photograph of him at the time working on the game. Uh, and he has said in, in later interviews that it was an absolute nightmare, uh, that he got very little sleep. He pretty much lived on coffee and cigarettes for about five straight weeks, trying to come up with something that worked that was enough of E.T. to make Universal Studios and Steven Spielberg happy. And so they finally make it. Uh, on the left here is the cover of the Atari 2600 version of E.T., the extraterrestrial. Uh, so the game did launch on time. In five weeks, they managed to get the game done. Here's a promotional poster. E.T. needs your help. One of the things they actually did was uh, they packaged free movie tickets, or coupons at least, for free movie tickets in with the box. Uh, so if you bought the game, you could get a free ticket to go uh, watch the movie in theaters. Now, the movie E.T. is a blockbuster hit. People love this movie. It is, uh, it is a huge, huge hit. But the game, the video game itself, is just indescribably bad. Like, I can't even... The words won't work to properly describe what it looked like. All I can do is play you a quick video clip of it here uh, as it loads. Um, let's see. We'll wait for it to load. Uh, so, yeah, it is... So here is part of the issue. They give them no guidance for what a game based on E.T. should be like. So what you do is you play as E.T. trying to collect parts for your spaceship. 
And then you fall in holes, and you have to lift yourself out of holes. And then you fall in holes again, and you have to lift yourself out of the holes again. And then what happens when you lift yourself out of the hole is that you wander around, and uh, then at some point you just keep falling into holes. Oh, there you go. Falls in another hole. There's. It was terrible. There was. It was. There was no fun to be had in this whole thing. The problem is that they manufactured tons of these games. They manufactured and printed tons of copies of this game because they thought it was going to be a, just like the movie, a massive blockbuster hit. But it wasn't. Atari was left with just tons and tons of unsold copies of this uh, of this game. They also had unsold copies of other games because when the ET game was such a terrible thing, it was it was notorious for being awful. Uh, it really hurt sales of the rest of their games. The thought was, if this E.T. game, which ostensibly has a connected brand to it, is so bad, then I bet the rest of their stuff's trash, too. So Atari was left with warehouses full of unsold copies of E.T., and they had a solution for it, which was they rented space at a landfill in New Mexico, they dug a giant hole, and they dumped a bunch of the cartridges in the hole, and then put dirt on top of it. And I promise you, when I tell you that, I am not kidding. That is a for real thing that they did. As a matter of fact, there's a documentary that they made recently called... Oh, let me put the screen over here. Still getting used to this online teaching thing a little bit. So if you're interested in this topic, and this is something that you think I might be kidding about, there is a documentary called Atari Game Over that came out in 2014. That's all about somebody's uh, decision to go try to find the landfill that has all the Atari ET copies in it. And they actually do find it and dig up a bunch of copies. Here's actually a picture from that documentary of a guy holding some copies of the game uh, in that landfill. And the sort of those three things put together. The fact that personal computers became so dirt cheap and you could buy one uh, and it could do a lot more things than just play games... And the fact that there were 12 different game consoles that came out during the same period of time. And the fact that the Atari quality of the Atari games were getting so bad at the time uh, that the video game industry crashes in on itself. People get tired of buying them. Uh, the stores get tired of just having them on the shelves collecting dust. So uh, the video game industry crashes. So the crash bankrupts so many companies that home video games were a toxic industry for nearly three years. Um, the A lot of the companies that were making those other consoles went out of business. A lot of third-party game manufacturers went out of business. Uh, it was just a thought at the time that, well, video games are done. They were a fad, and no one is interested in them anymore. But, as we know, we have video games now, so something surely must have happened to drag video games out of that crash and make them a profitable industry again. And that will be what we talk about on part three of this video series.